Hi, my name is Joe and welcome to another edition of Joe's Technology. Today I'm looking at how to set up the Oracle VirtualBox and we're going to do it on a Windows based computer and run a Linux based operating system on top of it. My assumption is, is that the vast majority of YouTube users are probably running some flavor of Linux on their computers. But you may have been hearing and hearing ever more often and <laughs> with greater volume chatter about Linux and you might be thinking to yourself you know I feel like I'm getting left behind and I can tell you honestly you are if you haven't learned Linux yet but this is your opportunity you can try it out on your Windows desktop without having to commit a machine that's the beauty of virtual machines so where do we get Oracle VirtualBox well here I'll just uh, oh, as you can see it remembers because I've been here before virtualbox.org. This is where Oracle uh, distributes it, so you can just go to the downloads and, and choose VirtualBox and install it. And so I already have it installed, so then we need an operating system. And in this case, I'm taking Linux Mint uh, from its site here. And here, I'll pick KDE, go to download links. Uh, remember, linuxmint.com, that's the official home for this project. Now, when I click on downloads, it doesn't bring me specifically to the KDE one. Uh, it actually is all the versions of uh, Linux Mint 17, which is the current long-term support release. As you can see, we have uh, versions here that are offered in 32 and 64-bit, and the difference is, is the amount of memory that they address. Uh, older computers that only run 32-bit operating systems uh, could only run 32-bit software, and they usually have 4 gigs or less uh, in memory whereas 64-bit systems are able to address much more memory and so for 4 gigs and above and a processor that supports 64-bit uh, you would choose the 64-bit editions. If you're curious as to whether your processor supports 64-bit processing it's a, just a matter of looking at the logo that uh, comes with any documentation. If it says Intel 64 or AMD 64 that indicates it's a 64-bit capable processor. 32-bit only processors are a bit rare now. Usually it'll be older computers that uh, have been in service for a long time. And that's why these 32-bit editions are made available, because old computers can still be useful with Linux. Um, that's one of the things that you hear a lot of is, as, uh, like, for example, Windows XP has already been abandoned by Microsoft. There are no more updates for it. It presents security challenges. These 32-bit uh, versions are perfect for old Windows XP machines. All right, so if I choose the 64-bit edition, I'm not presented with a download uh, immediately. I'm presented with a list of mirrors. As you can see, the flags of the world are flying. Um, and so you just simply choose a mirror in a country that's geographically close to you. One that I happen to uh, uh, pick very often. Let's see, where is it? James Madison University. This happens to be my personal favorite mirror living in the continental United States. Your part of the world may be different. So you can just pick whichever mirror it is that gives you the best performance. Uh, and is uh, and the closer the mirror, the, the better your connection will be. In order to save time for this video, I've actually already downloaded uh, my image. The image will come as this file here. As you can see, it looks like a CD that indicates uh, that the computer recognizes it as an ISO file. ISO files are basically um, it's a file that describes a disk image. This could actually be burned to a DVD, but uh, thankfully uh, Oracle VirtualBox will read ISO files natively. So I don't even have to burn a disk or set up a thumb drive. So here I'm just going to open up uh, Oracle VirtualBox and create a new virtual machine. Oh, as you can see, I've, uh, <laughs> I've tried out a few. This is the best way to learn, by the way. Always learn hands-on when you have the opportunity to do so. So if you hear about uh, some new operating system or technology, try it out. And virtual machines make it possible. As long as you've got plenty of hard drive space, you don't have to change your uh, host operating system. You can add things over and over and over again. So here I'm going to call this Linux Mint 17 KDE so that I know what I'm dealing with. As you can see, when I typed Linux, it automatically flipped over to the operating system type. To indicate to the computer that I'm using a 64-bit OS, I'll just pick Ubuntu 64-bit. The version of Linux that I'm installing is actually based off of Ubuntu. And uh, so, and it's a 64-bit edition, so I'll pick that. It'll ask me how much memory I would like to allocate. You're going to be limited by the physical amount of memory in your computer. 
Uh, personally, I like to give my virtual machines at least 8 gigs. Now I'll create a virtual hard drive. This is what will be presented to the virtual machine. It will not see the hard drive on my computer. It'll see this file, which purports to be a hard drive. And I have different formats that I can choose from. Don't worry about these other ones. You can just pick the default. This just offers compatibility with other virtual machine uh, technologies, uh, VMware, for example. You could actually import VMware uh, virtual machines into this because it'll read their formats. So I'll just stick with the default, which is VDI. Dynamically allocated or fixed size. If I say fixed size, whatever amount of hard drive space I specify will immediately get allocated that moment. So in this case, I'm going to choose 50 gigabytes as the size for my virtual hard disk. If I choose fixed, those 50 gigs are gone right now. The computer will actually format uh, a virtual hard disk and take those 50 gigs. With dynamically allocated, it will only actually use whatever I have saved. So I could tell the virtual machine you have 50 gigs available, but if it only saves 6, then the virtual disk is only going to be 6 gigabytes in size, in actuality, no matter what the VM thinks it really is. So it only utilizes the space that's actually utilized. So leave that on the default. And now it's asking me for the space. It, it presents 8 gigs by default. For me, that's just not enough. Your mileage may vary. Uh, I'm just going to choose uh, 50 gigs. should be good for me. And then I'll say Create. Now there are a couple of small little housekeeping changes that I like to make. This is just my personal preference. Um, I like to come in here and I uncheck the uh, uh, little mini toolbar which normally appears at the bottom of the screen. I also like to go in here and give it more virtual processors. Whoops, oh, <laughs> I wasn't done yet. Um, let's see, display. I'll give it a bit of display memory and enable 3D acceleration and just about everything else looks good. Now keep in mind that this uh, virtual machine software depends on the uh, virtualization features in the CPU being enabled. By default, many CPUs do not come with this enabled in the BIOS. So if you try to run Oracle VirtualBox and you get some message such as virtualization needs to be enabled on your CPU, see your BIOS or something, you'll have to log in and open up the BIOS and each BIOS is open in a different way so you'll have to consult your manual and find the uh, virtualization parameters and it'll just be a toggle switch enable virtualization yes or no or on or off ha however your BIOS happens to list it uh, I had to go and turn mine on before I was able to use uh, Oracle VirtualBox um, oh and as you can see here's a uh, the hardware virtualization. Um, before I was able to check that, I had to have it physically turned on. So by default, uh, you'll, you'll have to go and check that that's there if you'd like to utilize that. Okay, so now we have everything set. So we've defined our virtual machine, given it a name, given it the base parameters. We can see here in this roll-up sheet what it is that it either I chose or that it simply put in as an assumption. And, uh, oh, as you can see, it's set for NAT, which is Network Address Translation. So the uh, <coughs> virtual machine will utilize my network connection. Uh, so it doesn't need to know my Wi-Fi or anything else. <coughs> It'll just use the connection that the computer already has available for it. Okay, with all of that out of the way, let's go ahead and fire our virtual machine up. Now we have it selected from the list, so now we just hit Start. As you can see, the window fires up, indicating the name, so we know that we're on the right virtual machine. Whoops, uh-oh, <laughs> no bootable medium. Uh, one little step I forgot, and, and this is probably the best way to learn is to run into little problems like this. I'll right-click this, choose Settings. I forgot, we have to tell it where is that ISO image that we downloaded. Well, we can go here into Storage, and as you can see, we have a couple of different uh, items. See how it says Linux Mint 17 KDE VDI. So we know that this is our virtual hard drive. Ah, but look at this. This is a, an emblem indicating a virtual CD, or it can actually uh, connect directly to the CD-ROM if you want to read address directly from it. So in this case, I'm going to, let's see here, uh, choose virtual disk. And so it automatically downloads, uh, well, it goes to my downloads directory because I have it set. You may have to navigate to whichever folder it is that you dropped your file in. 
and now I can choose my ISO image. As you can see, it recognizes it natively and has it all set, and I'll just click OK. Now when I fire up Start, it should pick up that image automatically and boot. Ah, and I can see it is. So here, let's go ahead and we'll switch to full screen. Okay, so Linux Mint KDE 64-bit uh, uh, 17 is about to fire up. Takes a little moment here. How fast this runs, of course, will depend on your CPU, your memory, whatever hard disk it is that you put it on. So uh, some people have commented to me, they say, Joe, your virtual machine seem to run so fast. Well, <laughs> difference in hardware. And mine's actually an old computer. This one's a couple of years old. I'm about to upgrade to uh, oh, the Z97 chipsets just came out. And the uh, Haswell Refresh, uh, the Devil's Canyon series, are available. I'm looking forward to a nice new i7, but I'll make do with this for now. All right, as you can see, uh, we have a nice shiny desktop. Linux Mint is ready to go. As you can see, uh, in the old days, if you ever heard that, oh, Linux is too difficult, you know, you're not smart enough to set up Linux, don't even try. Well, those days are gone. Linux is a mature operating system. And as you can see, it's very simple. We have a nice desktop. Uh, in fact, we have applications. Um, it's even connected to the Internet already. As I mentioned, the virtual machine uses the internet connection. Well, uh, I'm connected to the internet. It uses the network connection. If you happen to be connected to the internet, it'll use that too, uh, of the host computer. So there was nothing to negotiate. It's ready to fire up, and I'm already online. But it's not installed yet. So as you can see, we have one icon on the desktop, Install Linux Mint. So now we want to go ahead and install our, our software on our virtual machine. And it's uh, pretty simple. Mint makes it easy to get through all of this. Let's see, we'll choose our default language. Oh, whoops, it's running out the screen. Ugh, Murphy's Law is in full effect. Um, <laughs> oh, and it doesn't resize, huh? Come on, are you kidding me? Well, I'm shooting this video in 800 by 600 because I was trying to keep the uh, file size low to make it easy to display on the widest range of computers possible, but apparently Mint expects you to have a little bit higher res than that, and by and large, most people installing Linux Mint 17 are probably going to be able to do better than 800 by 600 resolution. So don't hold this against Mint. This is just me being silly and trying to save space and inducing my own problems. Uh, so I'll hit continue. Oh boy, I may have to pull this back and forth. As you can see, it wanted 9.2 gigabytes. Remember, by default, our virtual machine only offered us eight. So we had to resize this in order to get this installed at any rate. So just remember, 9.2 gigs is the minimum for this particular edition of Linux Mint. So never take that eight gigabytes that uh, Oracle VirtualBox offers you. Choose more. So here, I'll choose continue. Now it offers us different uh, modes of installation. I'm just going to use guided just to make it easy. So you can leave the d default and say install now. So away it goes and it begins installing things. Oh, let's see, it'll ask us for a time zone while it's installing. This is a nice feature. I like the fact that you can still configure it uh, but you're not waiting on the installation. I'll leave it at the default. That time zone is fine with me. You can choose whichever time zone throughout the world is appropriate for you. And of course you have your choice of keyboards and boy there are a lot of choices. Thankfully I'm in the continental United States so the default US is fine for me. Oh and then here we're uh, choosing information about the administrative account. I don't know that it makes that very clear but uh, here, I'll just put Joe and choose a password. Oh, as you can see, it recognizes we're in VirtualBox, so it actually appends that to the name. I can call the computer whatever I want. So if I wanted to, um, Aries, there we go. So I could call my virtual machine anything I want, and that's what it's identified on the network as. Uh, let's see, choose my password. Uh, longer passwords are preferable for administrative accounts.
that's that's just my preference you don't have to go with a, a password as long or as complex as mine in fact there are even ways to run it with no password at all although I don't recommend that for uh, an administrative account and as you can see by default it's set to require my password to log in I would leave that alone so I'll just hit continue and let's see oh thank you for choosing Linux Mint and now it's time for uh, uh, it just to finish uh, copying all the files Now, although this is about as much fun as watching paint dry, one of my favorite analogies, <laughs> I'll leave it to you to guess why, um, I'll go ahead and continue recording just so you can see all the steps from start to finish. Remember, uh, it, how fast it goes, will, again, will depend on your hardware. So some people, depending on how much memory they're able to allocate or the speed of their bus or the power of their CPU or speed of their drives, uh, all those things will contribute and will make a difference as to how fast uh, or how powerful your virtual machines will be. Oh, that's right. Since it recognizes that I'm connected to a network which has internet access, it also reaches out and uh, pulls down additional software from uh, Linux Mint. So as you can see, it's specifically downloading language packs and uh, and other small little bits of software. It tries to also humor you and give you a little bit of information with a little slideshow as it's installing things so that you're not completely bored. Um, well, let's see, you know what? Uh, speaking of not being completely bored, one of the salient features of Linux Mint and one of the reasons why I recommend it so highly is that uh, for beginner users in particular, um, in the past, different versions of Linux looked really nice. Uh, um, Ubuntu really grabbed me the first time I saw it. Uh, and I saw it back in like version 1. And I was really impressed with uh, how they had everything laid out. But I quickly grew frustrated to find out that it didn't include codecs, it didn't include Flash, it was missing all kinds of things that were necessary to go to all the websites and services that I was normally accustomed to taking advantage of. Linux Mint specifically goes out of its way to include all of those things so that you basically have a version of Linux which is specifically geared to be a desktop that could be utilized both in the home or office that you plug in and it just goes. And it includes uh, many of the most common drivers for you know network cards, wireless devices, video cards, and uh, maintains uh, the ability to download those very, very easily in the event that you have a device that uh, is something that didn't uh, get included with the DVD. Uh, the DVD is, is, is largely a lot of drivers and codecs and, and other goodness that allow it to just be useful right away. I mean, new users, uh, particularly those coming from Windows, that try out a new operating system probably are not going to want to hear, oh, don't worry, that can be fixed. Oh, don't worry, this could be fixed too. They just want to use it. And I've seen people that have been Windows users all their lives sit down in front of Mint, and because everything was in a familiar place, I mean, we have something akin to the Start menu that uh, even Windows has abandoned with Windows 8. So in many ways, Mint is friendlier. I mean, we have nice little categories. It's real obvious what these are. Uh, people who have never used Linux before are able to sit down and be productive right away. And in many cases, uh, oh wow, our installation is complete already, find it um, friendlier to deal with Linux Mint than to deal with Windows 8. Okay, so we've gone ahead and told it go ahead and restart. Oh, it wants us to remove the installation media. Um, Alright, well that's a thornier issue because it's an ISO image and I'm in full screen and well here let's see if it's smart yeah it doesn't seem to care so now it's going to go ahead and boot into the uh, software uh, that it just installed onto our virtual hard drive And here we are. Here's our login screen. So to log in, I'll simply click the one account that's here 
and I can enter my password. Now you'll notice that it says Joe twice. <laughs> That's simply because I told it my real name is Joe and my account name is Joe. So it's actually showing, you know, in case you had, you know, some people like to have, you know, my name is Joe, but on the internet I am Tech Joe, you know, or and so it, it would show your login name. Uh, but mine happened to be the same, so it's Jojo. Okay, it takes a little moment. This is the first time we're firing up. Now keep in mind all of this is still running on top of Windows 7. So Porky Windows is taking up all the resources that it wants to take up and we're running Mint on top of it. Uh, but the benefit to us is that we get to try out Linux Mint without making any changes to Windows. And we can try out any other uh, types of operating systems that will run within the virtual environment, uh, which is quite a few. Oh, and uh, we have this nice little uh, screen, so it, it gives us features, information, there's the uh, user guide, you know, the software manager. This is used for installing programs. Um, personally, uh, eh, you, you may find all of this handy. Oh, by the way, sponsors, these are important. Linux Mint is a uh, community project, and interestingly enough, they do not sell um, consulting services and they do not sell merchandise. So uh, on the Linux Mint page they say if you want a coffee cup or something like that you, you go make it yourself. <laughs> you can download their uh, their emblems uh, from their page but uh, they don't sell any merchandise. Everything is entirely done through sponsorship. Some people are only able to give a few bucks, others give a lot more. Uh, I'm planning on making a, a sizable donation to Linux Mint myself. This is a fantastic project and it's all free. So here, I'll go ahead and close this, and now we have our Linux Mint 17 desktop. So since it's a virtual machine, it still takes advantage of uh, my connection. So here I can click and bring up Firefox, and as you can see, I'm connected to the internet, and I'm ready to go. And if I want to install any additional software in order to uh, add more things, I can go to the software manager. Oh, again, I'm challenged for my administrative credentials. Whoops! Uh-oh. <laughs> Obviously the security is working. I, I fat-fingered my password. Okay, I'm sure I typed that right that time. Yes, I did. Okay, so here we are at the software manager. Um, you know what, as a matter of fact, here, just as an example, here, let's download something. One thing I often do is I do web pages, and one little uh, program that I happen to like, well, here, I'll just type its name because I know it, is Bluefish. Come on, Bluefish, I know you're in here. Oh, maybe they stuck it under another category. Oh, it's probably under web. Or not blue wish. What am I talking about? Uh, blue fish. I promise I haven't been drinking today. Um, <laughs> that's an Easter egg for you. If you look at some of my other videos, occasionally you'll see uh, uh, different beverages in the background. See how many you can identify. Um, so here, here's blue fish. As we can see, it's a hypertext markup language editor. So it's used for making web pages. If I wanted to install this, I just click on it and choose install. So installing software in Linux Mint is that easy. And as you can see here, it's coming down the pipe. When it gets all the way to the end, it's here. And I can go back to categories. You can see there are a lot of packages. If you're setting up Linux Mint for the first time in your household and you've got small children, games. Let me recommend games. And uh, you got lots of free games. Uh, as a matter of fact, I think, hmm, I think all the ones that they list here are free, aren't they? I don't remember any uh, prices being associated with them. Um, I think they are all free. Um, oh, and by the way, uh, one one that I do re want to recommend above all else, 
Because if you're thinking to yourself, where can I get AAA titles? Did that darn Linux have any games? Yes. Steam has come to Linux. And, uh, let's see, I, I forget how many titles we have on Linux now. I mean, AAA titles. You know, Metro Last Light, uh, Witcher 2, I believe Witcher 3 is coming out uh, for uh, Linux, and, and quite a few others. So people are making the switch in preparation for the release of the Steam OS. And uh, although, to be honest, I enjoy Linux Mint, so I'll probably just continue gaming on Linux Mint. And one last little bit of housekeeping. Here's our little friend. A new update manager is out. Ah, so whenever we have updates, you'll see here on the little shield, it will let you know that there are updates available. You want to run your updates. Um, there are different levels here. Uh, let's see, I believe there is a... Um, oh, where is it? Oh, I forget where it is. Oh, phooey, I forgot. Well, there, there's a guide that shows all the different levels. Uh, 1, 2, and 3 are, are tested. You know, 1 are like official updates from the Mint team themselves. Let's see here. I'll, oh, and whenever you uh, click, it's going to, of course, challenge you for this password. So again, this is your administrative uh, credentials, because only the administrator makes changes to the system. Ah, here we go. And as I mentioned, there are different types. Um, let's see, where is it? Oh, I forget. There, someplace there's a little guide that says what all the numbers are. Five are dangerous. Notice that they're unchecked. And the reason that they're dangerous is that these are updates that are for testing, but this is bleeding edge stuff. Five is known to cause problems with stability. That's why they're in red. You know what, generally, I just leave that to somebody else. I'm only interested in updates that are categorized level 1, 2, or 3. So, level 1 are ones that are put out by the Mint team, known to be perfect in, in every way. Number 2 are heavily and widely used by the community at large. And number 3 are ones that are just believed to be pretty safe. And so, it's up to you which ones you install. I normally say 1 through 3 are good, uh, and I'll just keep installing my updates here. Whoops. Okay, so now we've installed a virtual machine. We've set it up. Uh, we can install software on it, and we can install its updates to make sure we're running the absolute latest version. So, um, well, you know what? Here, let me exit out of this. Uh, here, I'll close, because we want to go ahead and shut down our virtual machine now that uh, we have everything set up. So that is the Oracle VirtualBox. And like I said, we're still running on Windows 7. So try out Linux. Give it a shot for yourself. Um, I have to admit, that's, that's how I got started. I tried it out in virtual machines. And when I became comfortable enough with it, I was finally happy in, to leave Windows behind. And I have machines that run Linux and nothing else. And I'm able to get a lot of work out of them. Oh, and it's great because they're so stable. Everything's free. Well, more or less. Uh, Steam's not free. Um, well, the, the download to Steam is, but... And they do have some free games. But you know what? Steam offers such a great value. I don't mind paying for the stuff. Yeah, it's worth it. Great, great software. <laughs> Enjoy.